I have to introduce myself, Kathy Groshen. I'm a clinical social worker. Been at Kennedy for quite a long time, so I'm hoping to answer your questions today. Focusing really on 12-year-olds to 18-year-olds being teens, but then teens, um, teenage years technically end at 18 when you're officially an adult. Some agencies use 21 as their official cutoff for, for adulthood. And then, as I told you, um, we consider our kids on a journey and you know, we're not going to master everything by 18 or 21 necessarily. And so we're continuing this journey into adulthood. And there, there are strengths and weaknesses to programming in Maryland. Um, unfortunately, I have to say, Maryland is not at the top of the list for resources for a child or an adult with an autism spectrum disorder, but we're not without. So it is important to start your folder for teens to adulthood. And then um, be mindful of anything that you haven't applied for. Today is an opportunity just to remind yourself to go home and make that phone call or make that application as I touch on some of these subjects, okay? So let's move to the first slide. Um, again, I'm not gonna have to tell you everything so directly, but transition. It, the reason that we have to hit home the word transition, at age 14 in Maryland, you get this at your team meeting. Transition guide. Because there's two parts to the law. The Individual with Disability Education Act, the federal law for, for your child to get have a right to a free, appropriate education. The other part of it is a right to transition plan to adulthood. And in Maryland, that's age 14. And so they, they actually have transition planning at the IEP meeting. If you have a 504, you can ask for a transition planning meeting. If you're a homeschooler, technically, since you're high school diploma bound, it is your right to have a transition planning meeting. I'm just gonna let you consider that. So let's, I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but that word transition, you know, we have medical transitions and health transitions. This is really language for the education system, the word transition. So I use the Developmental Disabilities Administration, just an agency's definition of transition. Because this is an agency you're gonna hear about in a minute. But we need to plan and coordinate. And just like an IEP goal, transition planning should be outcome oriented also. It's not just a list of agencies and um, good information. It really is who's my child, what are they gonna need, how are we gonna get this um, accomplished, and um, you know, really are gonna move to an action plan. And it covers all these areas, and we might be thinking we're gonna talk about education only, but we're gonna talk about employment, because I believe that everybody has a right to an employment of, in lots of different levels of employment, but right to employment. Their social needs, their medical. This is coming up a lot more than it used to, but where is your medical care gonna be when you transition to adulthood? And daily living skills. So you can see we're thinking about some of that when your child is young. We're thinking about what their passions are and their strengths. Oh, maybe that's gonna lead them to their career choice. We're all about the education system. We're spending a lot of time looking at individual education plans and 504 plans and making sure that this is an appropriate placement. But education's goal is to help you be an independent adult. So we have to keep that in relation to what the end point is, and that is adulthood. What are the social skills for a child with an autism spectrum diagnosis? We just went over that it is a social and communication disorder. So a good program is gonna work on social all the time. This is a social world. A lot of language, so social and communication, yes, it's a vocabulary, we call it ASD, but it is, has a huge impact in your life. So you want to be working on social skills um, through school, in your home, in your community. Medical, okay, ASD is a developmental diagnosis, but there are some medical complications. Some kids have health risks like um, autoimmune issues where they have respiratory issues or gut issues or skin allergies like eczema. 
or other genetic um, problems. One in five children have seizure disorders. So when you come to an evaluation in a medical facility, you're getting a medical diagnosis and other related medical diagnoses. When you go to the school, it's an educational diagnosis. So there is a little bit of a different perspective um, in looking uh, at this through medical versus education eyes. And then daily living skills. I mean, that is part of school, that is part of home. Um, and um, I know you guys are all working on those. Okay, you gotta consider what you think is success. You're the parent. What is success for you, for your child? Um, what are your future goals um, that your child has? And we know that you know they might have goals that are lofty, loftier than they might be able to achieve. So those are important to start to think about. Okay, what supports are gonna need to be in place? You're right now thinking, what is the school system gonna do to support my child to get these goals? What other supports do you need? Okay, at, so for supported adulthood, now I'm just gonna jump at the end of teen years if your child has an ASD diagnosis and they have need for support, whether it's level one, two, or three in that severity list, they may still need support educationally, secondary education, train, um, vocational education, on the job, whether it's um, in one site or whether it's out in the community, in their living, again, membership in the community, uh, like you know, using transportation, um, and self-determination. You're gonna hear that a lot. We talk about teens, we're starting to hear what they want. So the slide before was, what are the goals for your teen? It's important, this is, this is a cooperative process. So they need to understand, they'll have a voice. They'll, at age 14, they'll come to their own team meetings. Okay, so they need to know what that's gonna be like and what their agenda would be when they're called on. Okay, so this is a little redundant, but again, results oriented. And we can coordinate, and there are helpers out there I want you to coordinate with. So we're gonna get to that. And I just hit it again, an IEP for me after age 14 is really the transition IEP. Don't just be thinking about how many, you know, levels of math support, I mean, how is this math gonna work on the clock and in money, and um, what kind of math skills am I gonna need for uh, being in the construction business versus math skills to be an engineer, and um, you know, IEP goals need to be helping that person get the courses to get to the end for the career that they're gonna have. So we really are looking at IEPs all along as moving to adulthood. Uh, have I overwhelmed you? Okay, good. Because <laughs> you all have teens and you have a primary school child, so this is actually giving you prep. Good. Um, so after high school, you know, the what, the where, the when, and the how. Um, and it's different. So here we have a kid getting an AA degree in um, CCBC. And then from there, they could go on for further education for your college if that's what they desire after an associate's degree. Um, this um, particular student went straight to college, okay? But not everybody's going to be in a secondary education setting. We're gonna talk about that more in a little bit, but how about for a child who really needs to be in a protected environment either to be a good roommate, to be a good worker, to be a good citizen. So working to be independent for dressing and making your bed and making your lunch and accessing transportation, really important life skills. So we wanna promote independence. Um, there are all these tools. I just happened to pick one because the iPad is actually a really important um, device that kids are getting exposed to, are using. It can be a toy, but it can also be a really functional communication device. Um, it can be an organizer. If you have an ASD diagnosis, you're a reactor. You're not as planful. 
um, it's hard to it's hard to make all the good problem solving decisions. So organizing is a really important need. There are things that can be downloaded to organize your schedule, your, everything. Um, you know, from pictures, if your child uses picture exchange, to um, social stories, verbal lists. There's all kinds of things that um, the iPad has. And actually, um, just to let you know, I think a lot of the school systems and uh, list money will pay for an iPad, but just be careful that it's not a toy. Otherwise, it's just a really expensive toy. Um, but functionally, it can be a blessing. Anyway, so there are these um, tools out there where you start to work with your child to figure out what is your child's interest areas. Um, it might be too much paperwork. Um, I like things that can get stored on an electronic device. So you don't have to download this, but it's just um, any way that you have a checklist to think, am I working on um, community navigation? Am I working on um, meal planning? Whatever, there are all kinds of tools out there to just make sure you've covered the list of 27 things that it takes to plan a meal. So the teachers do that and break down the curriculum, um, but there are things that you can get to make it easier at home on those skill sets. So this one happens to be on transition. Um, I mentioned this already just to remind you, the reason we talk about transition in school is the Individuals with Disability Education Act, and this is what Maryland has put together to give you for transition planning. It's going to list these agencies that are on my cheat sheet that I've given you. Um, so if we don't have one of those, where are we going to get it from? Well, your county is what? Baltimore. That's right, you said Baltimore County. So call over to uh, Sari Gordon Hooper's mm -hmm. office and have them Sorry, talk to them about this. A link on um, Google. Oh. Yeah. It's actually in your handout the guides. I meant you want to have a meeting though, don't you? You want to have a transition planning meeting? No, I want to see it. Oh, just okay. The link. Thanks. Yeah, the link is on there and I'll get to it in a minute. Um, there's a whole bunch of links on there. So um, in some states, if you moved, it would be 16, but in Maryland, it's 14, which is good. Start early. So the ADA. This is about our accommodations in, in the community, um, in college, in, on the job, in your housing. So how it gets translated in schools are you have an individual education plan with accommodations also listed, or you only have a 504 plan. And that's just accommodations only because you don't get an IEP for an, I, for an autism spectrum disorder. You get an IEP for reading, writing, and math, and social emotional behavioral goals. Okay, but if you don't qualify for enough, you know, percentage of weakness areas in those, you don't have an IEP, you'll just get accommodations. And, you know, a significant accommodation could be you're in a typical class this size, but you have trouble focusing and you need an aid. Many parents try to get an aid as an accommodation if their child is still academically able to do regular classroom work. That's a, just an example. Okay, but you can ask, so again, you can ask for an IEP, I mean a transition plan with a 504 plan. Um, so our guys end up into this um, adult era um, area of, at different ages. If you graduate from high school, have a lot of high schoolers are graduating 17 and a half. Socially, emotionally, they're two thirds their age, and there is a big gap in what the state of Maryland offers. Maryland's adult service providers start at age 21. Okay, so just I'll come back to kind of explain that, but that's a that's a big issue. So you can be smart enough to get diploma track. And then you're going to need a plan for what you're going to do after 17 and a half. Okay. Um, Department of Mental Health and Mental Hygiene, I'm just throwing this out. Um, they have their own planning guides, um, navigating the transition years. Um, uh, the health department overlaps with them, and they have a, um, some health guides. But that is 
important just because um, there are some mental health services that you may need and they actually extend to age 26 is what they're looking at and then uh, it's kind of vague how it's working but the mental health system is not going to be your primary system for your for your teens with ASD it's really going to be a developmental perspective not a, not not the emotional disorder perspective even though they overlap the kids with ASD have significant levels of anxiety um, also depression so you do overlap and um, but Typically, SD services are left in that developmental category. Okay. So, what age do you want to start planning? Uh, congratulations being here for your child being young. You're starting to think about that. Um, you're not going to let it sneak up on you. <laughs> Diplomas are a little confusing. As you know, you can be a homeschooling parent and your child doesn't get a diploma. There's a carve out and you can homeschool and get a diploma, but that's rare. Most people don't get a diploma who are homeschooled. Um, the difference with high school um, diploma also is you have to pass the high school assessment test in Maryland and you have to pass your courses. You have to have the credits, so you have to have a curriculum that is observed by the school system. So I'm sure you're checking yeah. in. They're not making you check in and show that you've... Not by the school system. Who's checking yours? My that, umbrella. Oh, okay. And they say, yes, she gets credit for the courses. Well, she could have graduated at 14. She has her credits. She's got her credits. Well, you're, you've moved fast, so can, good for you. So um, you can be out of the norm. So you, she could have graduated at 14. You can still go on to Community College of Maryland without a high school degree. You can, um, you don't have to take the SATs either. It's just one thing about the community colleges. Um, you can get a GED. You can skip high school diplomas altogether, and you can be any age and get a GED. Study, take the test. I think there's a bias out there. I don't think people with a GED are um, evaluated the same as a person who has a high school degree. So. You're already a step further in the entry to the world of work with a high school degree. Um, okay, if you are on a certificate track, which you have to determine by age 16 that your child's on a certificate track, you don't get the high school degree, you get a certificate of completion of your IEP goals. That's what that stands for. And then it typically is in your 21st year of your life that you finish these IEP goals. You can, um, you can take that IEP to college um, by achieving a program in school till age 21. It's a little se more seamless to go into adult services because they start at age 21. So your, your child's covered um, more seamlessly from its school system into the world of adult services. But you, there are actually some secondary education programs that will admit you with a certificate program also now. There are a few that have gotten started. So with that, the world of secondary education is changing too because we actually have emerging adults more so than we have adults at 21. So there's a shift in opportunities now. One thing you have to do, one thing a lot of places will not tell you, is if you have an umbrella for review for homeschool, whether the child's learning disabled or not, the, the entry level colleges, such as a community college, are much happier to accept the student because they've already had a third set of eyes on their work. That's a good point, and I didn't know that. Thank you. So um, there are different ways to get to the same end. As long as your journey really does keep in mind the end point of, of towards independence adults in, in whatever degree. Um, okay, so just you got to brainstorm before your IP meetings. I always tell parents sort of quarterly to reassess who's helping you, what's going on, what the outcomes are. 
as you're getting close to doing transition planning, okay, at age 14, most parents walk into an IEP meeting. And there's two places that I want parents to really think through um, before they enter the meeting. You're gonna get a draft. You're gonna review to see what the goals are. You're gonna understand where they're gonna deliver it, whether it's in group or individual. You're gonna see what, you know, you know the assignment. They're already in school, in a program. What you need to know is that you can have parental input, that parent input section. I have parents who write, I don't have an example up here, but two pages and they laminate it and they give it out to every member of the team. What you do and you don't do, what your child likes and doesn't like, how to, what behavior strategies you're working on or communication. You, know, you can do this in a lot of different ways or you can just talk about your agenda and it'll get into the IEP. But it's nice that you could just hand it out and everybody has a copy so that at least you, you know, you're not 51% of the vote in an IEP meeting. But it gives you an opportunity for you to, ha to touch everybody on the team with what you think is your perspective and really helpful hints. Um, the other place is that transition plan. That's another section on the IEP starting at age 14. Think through really, you know, whatever guides you use to figure out what your transition is going to look like, where your child wants to go, where you want your child to go. Um, start to pay attention to that because you can sculpt the courses that they take for your child and get the team to help you with that. So that is really good collaboration. Typically the transition planning at a team is here's your guideline, go sign up for these agencies. And this isn't just about agencies. Okay. Um, so you could see that there are a lot of areas that you know about that don't get perfectly reflected on an IEP meeting, I mean IEP document. Um, but I think it's a good guide because in that transition planning section, you can start to think about you know, what are the functional life skills that I really need to work on. Toilet training is huge. You want adults to be able to meet those independent needs. You want um, to be able to manage your money or your debit card or your, or, you know, read that kind of clock or the digital clock. Um, there are just some very important things and that's not going to jump off reading, writing, math necessarily. So I just think it's important to think about the whole picture. Um, what are the social skills? Social skills should be practiced in every setting. Um, and so we don't want to regress what I see happening a lot are teens that have a problem solving mistake or um, they're communicating in a way that is not as functional for a particular classroom. And so we restrict them, we take away their rights. We want compliance more than their comprehension. I'd rather your kids understand as much um, and comply, but it's not just all about compliance. So we don't want to be taking everything away and our child end up with just a one-on-one -on -one, and that's their little world when really all this other stuff is going on in the classroom. So being integrated into this big world is so important. Um, um, being able to understand what your condition is. There are some places that my condition, I'm deaf in one ear, is going to interfere. I need to speak up. Other places, I could just ignore it. So your child needs to be able to have that voice of understanding about their condition. I don't know if anybody has talked to their, if you talk to your kids about it. Um, what do they understand about their autism spectrum disorder? And these are, you know, obviously so much more here that can get brought in. But these are good things to think about because preferences and interests become passions, become future jobs. Okay, so those future jobs and preferred areas. I've got a guy who wants to be a pharmacist, but he is in a helping role. Um, you know, he actually, um, I won't get too specific, but he has a job in the pharmacy setting that is um, not um, higher level math and language. And he, he's, he's stocking, basically. And that works for him. Um, 
I've got another guy who really wanted to be an airplane pilot, but working at the airport, he gets to go out on the observation tower and see the airplanes for a break, and he loves working at the airport. And I can go on and on and on about how you know, taking a preferred interest area can shift um, to a career. Okay, in your IEPs, you know, you feel such responsibility as a parent. You can take support with you. You can take siblings. You, um, you can take um, your community. Let's say if you have your child in a, in a church group, the person who's running the group could come to the meeting. You could have um, service providers. Like if you have uh, an autism waiver um, team, you can bring that person to your meeting. Don't forget that you probably do want to bring somebody with you. It's hard to be in these meetings by yourself. It's, it's emotional, it's um, informative, but maybe you need a check and balance just to have somebody else there with you. Okay, so I did start to say, you I mean, there are lots of agency people that you could invite. You know, if you have a, a mental health provider also, include them. Okay, now this isn't just bringing them to a team. It's very hard to get professionals to leave and come. But give them a copy of the IEP or important information that you've gotten out of that IEP. Share it back with your community helpers. You know, like you have a service coordinator. Let's keep them up to date about who, what, where. Um, so that you have relationships when you really get to that last piece of, of moving into adulthood. This is a very hard switch. Um, school, IDEA, um, this transition planning, you're entitled to. It's, it's a federal law. A graduation, whether it's a high school degree, you've finished um, your GED, or you have your um, certificate, there is nothing that you're entitled to after that, nothing. So you become eligible for things eligible for health care, eligible for adult services, financial, legal, and so there's waiting in line. So there are some, wait, some markers that are important to, to hear about, like an insurance policy. You want to cover your basis. If your child needs it, you're right there able to get what you need at the time. Or make a decision that you don't need it, but at least cover your basis for now before you know. Training, and I really put in my mind like volunteer work. So if you're a church, you hand out the books. If you, you know any kind of chore, any kind of training um, is invaluable. And put that on a resume, because you really are starting to um, document if you're gonna be eligible for something, your child has to interview, and you wanna have a resume that shows what they've done and the variety of things that they've done. I guess document, you know, stick it in a file. Start to if you go to a transition fair, if you go to an Autism Society of America meeting, if you um, hear about a program and pick up their flyer, stick it in your folder. Some of it's going to change by the time your child's an adult, but sometimes the names change, but the themes often are the same. And just keep yourself organized. Funding's big. I have to be really honest, you cannot afford adult services if your child needs it. You need a funding source. So you have to be right there ready to take the funding that the state of Maryland has. It changes you know, through time, but right now there is a system I'm going to tell you about for funding. Oh, and these were those websites. Okay, so you wanted the Department of Education, um, the transition planning. And you want Autism Speaks, because I gave you that handout already of that, with that website. Um, Doors has one, Division of Rehab Services. Okay, I'm going to talk about Doors in a minute, but it, Doors is available to anybody who has a disability and is looking for vo things that support you vocationally. And it's through the Department of Education. It's a short term program. 140 hours, four months, short term. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, okay, and then mental health and mental hygiene, I showed you this one. Um, I like this one a lot, MarylandTransition.org. Try to organize all the youth transition 
um, programs and there's a transition fair November 15th down at the airport. Um, there are transitions in most of the counties and a lot of the non-public schools have their own transition meetings. There's differences in transition meetings. You can have ones where it's just finding out about the same material I'm talking about today or transitions um, fairs where um, people who have been successful come back and talk about their experience. And then there are others where it's just tables of providers. You need that too. You need to see that adult service providers are all very different from each other and start to figure out how that would work for you. Okay, so let's just talk about programs now. Has everybody applied to DDA? No? Okay. So go home. This is online, or you can print it. And where, what county are you in? Okay, so you're in the Central Maryland region. Don't obsess on it. It's about eight pages. You know, your child's social security number, it's filed under that. Information on your child's worst day you use um, to check off these checklists. Then it's your information. You don't have to sign up somebody f as a reference. On the bottom, you just say, I want autism services for my child. It just goes in. And what it, this is a beginning important step for every child, whether you ever use it or not. It gives you the opportunity when your child's 21 to be able to get some, some funding for adult programs if your child needs that. So DDA used to work with kids and then, then they changed it to age 14 and up and as of March of this year, they really only want to think about adults except for list money, we'll come back to that in a minute. But age 21, because there's this money that the state has, a lot of people call it TY money, so Governor's Transitioning Youth Initiative. So you graduate, I, you know, if you've got that gap, those gap years, you know, typically people do something with doors or college or whatever. Um, but if you're going to need, if you have a developmental disability and are going to need help with the job or on the job or um, where you live, you're going to need money for the programs that provide those services. And this money starts at age 21. So between 21 and 22, there's this money that now your child has for adult providers and then that continues. If you miss this, you're on a list. You're on a very, very long list for DDA. Now, here's the difference. If, like, your child and your child, maybe they both are developmentally disabled and they look to service coordination that helps DDA make decisions, they look developmentally disabled. But another person could say, hmm, I don't think this person's really dis developmentally disabled. They're, they just need supports. Supports only will give you nothing. You know, it's a phone call, they'll tell you what agency to call, and that you're done. So when you apply to DDA early on, you might only just get a letter saying, thank you for applying, you're, you know, you're on supports only. You're going to need to get that switched up to developmentally disabled to actually get any money out of the state of Maryland as having a disability. Yes, but they typically start to look at your child. Now you're homeschooling, right? So I need you to call them because he's kind of off the radar because they start to look at kids at school in these transition meetings and say, you know, age 1920, I need to get all the documents, an exit document, all these things that are in place in the school system. Um, it makes their it makes it more integrated for them as service coordinators, but you're going to need somebody to figure that out with you in your select situation because you don't want to miss 21 to 22 because you'll miss the money and then you could be on a list of 19,000 people. But if he's already on the list? 
the list of that they've marked the money for him. You've gotten all the steps done. I now know that he is a disabled adult and he has this adult service plan now. And he's not going to have that unless you have DDA working with you. She's saying there's two lists. One where you're on hold and one where you're already in line for services. So it's like two lists. And you've got to figure out a way to get somebody to help you to get him from this list and definitely put on this list. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's, I've been in touch with them even recently. Like he gets like horseback riding lessons through mm -hmm. the, the list program. Yeah. So they do know that he's out there. They do. The system is more seamless when you're in a certificate program because everybody's name gets sent over to service coordination. Oh, he's going to graduate. This is the date. It, they start doing their work. Um, remember, it's just since March that there's been some shifts. Now there's three service coordination agencies, not just service coordination, Inc. So, with some of the changes, I just really need, you should get back in touch with DDA and find out when and especially when you need to have a meeting with them so that you are assigned a service coordination per person of one of those three agencies and get him deemed development disabled for that last step of money that you want to secure for him. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. You said low intensity support services, LIS. Okay, so DDA does have some money, four and a half million dollars for children and adults for low intensity support services money. Okay, so as a social worker, they've always had some way to get some monies. A couple of years ago, about three and a half years ago, LIS appeared. It was $3,000 and we realized after the first year that there were going to be more people applying than there was going to be money. So we said, everybody apply July 1st. Everybody who got it applied July 1st in the four regions. So that has now become common knowledge. So now they have you know, this many applications for this amount of money. So this year it's a lottery system. And it's not July 1st because they couldn't handle the mobs of people lined up at their door to drop off their applications. So now it's switched to the whole month of July. And if you didn't get it in July, in that lottery, if they didn't pull your file out, you can reapply in January. Or if you didn't know about it, you can apply in January. Okay, so the bad news is, now they've got, they had this whole month and they've got a better website now under DDA um, Low Intensity Support Services. So now children and adults, their applications are sitting there. They're taking their time with the lottery. No one in this central region has gotten notified as of Friday afternoon whether they got the money or not. So the applications came in in July, we're in September. So those parents who asked for camp to be reimbursed are making a payment plan. They don't know if they've been chosen yet. They don't know if they, you know, it's disorganized. But it's $2,000 for your child for horseback riding, um, a, a fence, a foot fence around your property, whatever the need is. So I have families who are self-pay and they could get an evaluation paid for. There's, there's lots of different things, but it, the combinations have to add up to 2,000. Well, if you're pulled in a lot. So it's one agency for two of the regions. It's Penmar for this, this area. Right. And so Penmar is taking their time because they couldn't handle what happened to them last year. All these applications one day and need to get back to people within the next week. So they're just doing it in their, their best way and it's taken forever. So if anyone's applied for a list and they haven't heard, it doesn't mean you didn't get it. They're still figuring this out and you probably you should hear very soon. But, and if you didn't get picked because you're still, you know, stacked of, in the pile, you can send that application all over again in January. It has to be perfect because they want to get, you know, people ruled out. But it's $2,000, which is a significant amount of money. Okay, so Penmar, you know, you can see this is why Penmar is so slow. And it's a two-page application, but the parts of it have to be perfect. Anybody besides you? Anybody else done this? Try it. I mean, when it works, it works beautifully. Okay, so this is under MSDE, Maryland Department of 
education. And um, the hard part about doors is they do a little bit of everything. So they teach you driver's ed if you have a disability. They do a career work assessment to see what, not just not just looking at your psychological, intellectual abilities or your um, neuropsychological functioning, but what is your career? What's your work um, assessment? And then they often assist with helping you to link up. You can have really good assistance and you can have just sort of, you know, cursory help, but it's a short-term model, but people with ASD do get priority. So you get seen within, a, within the six months versus waiting. So a lot, so a perfect scenario is a child finishes school at 20, perfect scenario in terms of seamless. Finishes child, the child finishes at 21. They have doors pay for programming between May and July. And then July, your adult provider, your TY money starts. And from 21, you have adult services. Because between May of graduation and the completion of your certificate, States of fiscal, works on the fiscal timeline, so it's always July 1st. There's a little gap, but doors could fill that gap. So some people get it, get it all tightly organized, but many people don't. So it just, it's always really good just to stay on top of it and try to keep filling in the gaps and knowing what's available to you. Okay. Oh, oh by the other thing I wanted to say though about lists, I think that um, LIST is going to give out only to families who have DDA applications in. They tried it for a day this summer and everybody protested and they took it back. But I was like, that, you know, heads up, let's all make sure that we tell everybody to be on the DDA list to apply if you're going to apply for LIST money. Okay, so moving on. Autism waiver. Has everybody been on the autism waiver list? Okay. You're I'm going to it, and it was weird because when my son and the kindergarten was diagnosed with it, they were saying that it had to be a much more severe autism in order to qualify for the autism waiver, but has that changed? Yes, but he's too old to get seen because unfortunately the list, it's back to 2006, so everyone from 2006 to 2014 who put their names on the list haven't gotten their name called yet because it goes in order. But it's just another insurance policy. I mean, if you, um, if you are 20, you can still get an autism waiver um, if your name comes up. Many people are going to age out before they get the waiver anyway. But it's really better for adult service, I mean, for uh, teen services, like a community program where um, you, you and your helper practice social skills or do something on um, in a social way on the weekend. Um, the nice thing about this program is the parent doesn't have to be there, so it is better for older kids who are practicing their community skills. Waiver means it's waived out of your income. So there is the autism waiver, and then there is the living at home waiver at adulthood. You can apply at 18. That covers this huge group of adults who have all kinds of disabilities and needs. But I just want you to know about it. It's another carve out of your income. So you, you can have a lot of income and still get a, a waiver program if you meet that criteria. Okay, yes? Can you tell me a little bit about that program? Does it supplement the cost of living at home? It actually, um, it's gonna change, but it's more, um, what's the, so um, if in order to get to work, I need help getting dressed and organizing myself and getting to the bus, um, I might need a helper to do that. That would be an example. Everything is, you know, it's funding dependent and I've been around long enough that you know, funds increase and then they go away, you know, and I'm, I can't tell you when each of your kids is a, an adult, what the funding's gonna look like. But it's always just, again, you just put yourself on these lists in case, it's like an insurance policy, in case it's going to meet my needs. This one I need everybody to know about. Okay, supplemental security income. It actually is not under your traditional social security, it's under your taxes. But you apply it social security. 
And at age 18, it doesn't matter about your parents' income, because under 18, it's family income dependent and disability. You have an ASD diagnosis, that's a moderate to severe diagnosis. That, the medical piece is covered. You cannot have more than $2,000 in your own name to apply as an adult at 18 for SSI. So don't, don't load the bank account. If you think there's gonna be some family money inheritance and you wanna make sure that's for, available to your child, get a special needs trust, get you know the uh, benefits on your insurance. Um, there's a book called Planning Now, and I have a couple copies up here if anybody would like to look at this, looking at estate planning, special needs trusts, the legal pieces that you might be interested in. Um, but for the most part, you know, keeping, keeping it clean, under $2,000, your adult has adult privileges. And if they can't make their own decisions, you become the payee and they get medical assistance. So they get a health plan, which is really important, and a benefit, 710. However, um, supplemental security income is now taking out rent from your child's payments because you're supporting them and feeding them. So it's kind of like in-kind services. So when you go to apply, take a rent, a lease, you know, one-page lease, fill it out that you're charging them rent. The going rate's a third of the monthly, this keeps going up. So a third of the benefit payment a month, and you, you don't, I mean, you can keep that in your log that you charge them that rent. You'll actually get more money out of your benefits. And you can just download a one-page lease off the internet. They're all the same. So the nice thing is you get a health insurance plan with the SSI. You still can be working on college, vocational skills, all those things if you become financially independent and you lose your SSI, congratulations. But it's, it actually is the great bridge in the meantime. Yes? I'm going for the benefit to come to my son because he's not going to be able to take the money and use it appropriately. It will come in my name for him. Yes. So do I have to be appointed guardian? Do I have to go through no. the process? No. Okay. No. No. You, you're appointed payee. Okay. okay. So we're going to talk about that guardianship. That's a little trickier. But there are some legal things that you can do. One of the legal things is to have a, an ID. So if I am homeschooled and I'm walking down the street with a hoodie on because I, it feels more comforting, and you, you know, targeted yeah, if I don't have an ID. These are, I'm telling you a true story. So it's really important, anybody can get an ID, I think after age eight now in Maryland. And drive. You pay $10 if you're homeschooled to get one and it has your photo and your stats. Okay. Or is, you know, some kids are ready for um, a learner's permit. It's the same I... HSLDA, though. You have to join HSLDA. Uh, the homeschooling network? Okay. The homeschool law. Good. Mm -hmm. So there's good things about protecting people. And I can tell you it's about protection. You really do need to be... You, uh, you need to learn not to give your Social Security number out to people. <laughs> yes? I just wanted to remind you, I did check this summer to see what the age was. Uh huh. You said now it's an infant that didn't get an ID. At what? At infant? infant? Oh, it moved back down. Okay. So we all can have an ID. That's good. You can't open a bank account without an ID. You can't get a bus pass without an ID. So there's, and really, you just want to be able to identify who you are. It's for, for safety. Um, Okay, and um, I am going to talk about college real briefly because things are changing. So what is out there available? Now, I don't know in your deaf community what the Gallagher services are, um, but um, CCBC does have a sign language program. Okay, so, but um, the success program is actually for individuals at, and it's at UMBC that have graduated with a certificate and are going to go to a four-year college program for kids with certificates. So it's modified at UMBC and it's specifically called the Success Program. Montgomery um, County Community College has a program. So there are things are shifted now. So I have guys who go to CCBC for um, an, an art program because they really need to 
modify their skills for the thing that they're going to do on the job, but they may not actually get the whole degree. And I have other guys who've taken six years and gotten an AA degree. And um, again, every time you've got that degree, it's proof of stick to itiveness and your skill set, and there's a lot of benefits to keeping you organized during that limbo period of emerging young adults. Because remember, with an ASD diagnosis, you're at least two-thirds your age, socially, emotionally. So I think more things are going to happen um, in that secondary education. There are a lot of um, college, okay, this is just about um, CCBC. Um, there is actually over at Dundalk, this single step program, it's really much more supported. So you actually have, you meet as a group and you stay organized through your day to complete your college. Um, it's a little extra charge, but it's, it tightens up being able to be successful in their program. Um, for kids who are considering going to college, this is an incredible summer camp, four weeks, at Howard Community College. And you don't have to live in Howard County. It's, it's inexpensive. It's, I think it's less than $600 for a four-week camp. But um, you actually get all of that prep for being able to navigate as a college student. Um, it fills up fast, so it's worth checking into um, the beginning of winter. Upward Bound, that's um, first generation um, college students in some geographic areas. This is a really expensive but very successful college program. They um, support the student in their social skills and their um, navigation through their, um, their courses and their, and their living. Um, and they, so they provide housing and that's organized to be able to be a successful student, but it's very expensive. And Towson University has this Hussman Center, so it's mentorship. Anybody whose child is 17 and over, you can go to their um, social group. It's once a month on a Friday night, like six to eight, and it's um, you know, three or five dollars, something like that, but it's, it's a social activity group. So it's um, Towson University students who are in the health sciences programs provide mentorship and they have a lot of other programs besides just this party once a month but it's a really nice um, opportunity to socialize and then the mentorship they have courses and you can look at their whole list because there are a lot of nice things where the mentor one student to one um, client coming in through the Hussman Center. And you don't have to be a, a Towson University student to be a client at the Hussman Center. Marshall University has a big model for um, supports. So there's like levels one through four supports. Hopkins is going to have level one support. There's a disability office, but you have to, you know, maybe you go in for getting your English paper reviewed. And then there's level four support, where it's the most support. And you get your whole day organized um, as a college student. A lot of people are going online. It's another way to get to the goal. Yes? Is there a way to access Autism Speaks or something, lists of colleges that would have programs available? Yes, and it's growing all the time. Like this Marshall program now is a model for Western Michigan and some other programs, and they're really they're, they're, they're happening. And then there's a list of those middle supports, you know, the twos and the threes. And you just, you know, it's a Google search. And there is a website, but I can't remember the website off the top of my head. Yeah? I have a question. There, there are a list of actual, like, I wouldn't call them colleges, but I guess that's the term they use for them that people who are on the spectrum can go to to learn just transition. And then there's two types. Is there a reason why you didn't include that? So tell me what your definition of transition is. You mean because it teaches support? To, excuse me? You mean the support part of it? How to navigate through? It teaches them exactly the same. It teaches them how to function in going from a high school setting mm -hmm. into being a college person. Yeah. There are it teaches them social supports. It teaches them the opportunity to have 
someone be there if they need someone to help transcribe whatever it is so it does everything for them so it breaks based down on, like what is my what are my right. opportunities once because I get to they, school they where's they the help those. yeah so this program does it um, this is a bigger list but there are those other lists within that so um, and if you if you included that that would be really helpful for people it's another this. it's probably another hour because Doors no, has it, if you yeah. Give them a oh, slide okay. Saying, look, well, yes. here are some links that you could mm -hmm. have an opportunity to check out. It would be most helpful. It will collaborate because you helped me in that. I probably have a pile of papers about this high by my desk because there's a, a download for every one of those. This is a huge subject area right now. So, all the self-determination literature, how to, how to learn that, the, so, the social skill literature, and really the college prep stuff. So within that, you are right. Like, you know, the school bus doesn't stop here is another great website. I, there are lots of them out there. Because a lot of these kids, even if they go to public school, they don't know how to take a bus from this side of the campus to the other. And some need a shuttle yeah. to do that. But these places that are very specific, that are designed for autism spectrum mm -hmm. persons, really is important to have people understand that there are specific colleges for them. Yes, and Marshall, it's been like the cutting edge. It's a great example. In fact, they were at the um, uh, Autism Society of America National Conference back in the summertime and spent a lot of time talking about it was an hour and a half just on transportation. So there's a lot of pieces to this. Um, this group has a great flip chart of all the skills you want to learn to navigate as an independent adult. There's so much material. By the time your kids are really ready to be out there, it's, there's going to be more. But, um, you know, you can have all of these papers, but you have to know how to use them effectively. And it's not just, oh, this is a great curriculum. It's, I'm at the middle here, but oh, I am only at the, um, at the beginning point on this particular skill. Like I have a guy who can do calculus in his high school, but he really is going to get stuck on money. He has a visual issue. Formula, formulas he's great at. So it's really knowing strengths and weaknesses, and, and you've got to really think through the teaming. But colleges, I mean, I can tell you, like a good example is that um, over at um, in Owings Mills, Newtown has a really cool program with Cisco. It's a computer application. So kids who are really into it can go to CCBC because they have that next level of Cisco. And if they've done really well there, they can go to Towson University that has the next level again of Cisco. So there are ways to, to that some programs are laid out beautifully. And some things are a little harder to acquire. Um, but it, being creative is really important. I'm sorry, just to clarify, so there's a specific Cisco program? It's a, it's a technical program? It's a technical program. It's, um, it's not just uh, computer uh, engineering, but it's a specific package. So a lot of corporations would hire a Cisco trained person to come into their IT department. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Firstly, thinking back to what she was talking about, where they're actually going to get some training, because that's, that's a fear that you have once they leave and they have to go to a college campus. We can't walk on a campus with them. Right. You know, so if this information is provided, project access, it's going online and they have information. Yeah, I'm, it's, I'm it's on the Howard County Community College website and underneath of it's project access and I would call the director. She's, this has been going on for a really long time and we have a lot of volunteers that come and work with us. I've, I've been going to wonderful the private colleges. but local, it's the, on the Howard County and everything. And yeah. Uh, I know there isn't the, something for everybody everywhere, unfortunately. That kind of program is where it is because that county has got this. Like, okay, so if you want your child to have access, you got to go where the money is. Mm -hmm. Plain and simple. And since it is the county in this country that has the most money, then that's where you go. Howard County is the best county for ASD services in Maryland. So we do have some Howard County folks here. Tonight there's a transportation discussion of the Howard County Autism Society of America transition group. So there are parents who've now 
And you can go to those meetings. I go to those meetings sometimes if I want to hear a speaker. Um, they've carved themselves out of the Howard County Autism Society of America because their kids are at transition age and they're working together. And there's another subset working on housing within that transition group. So parents can make a lot happen. Uh, it was a dad in Montgomery County that started the autism waiver. Um, so we need more is what I know you are saying. It'd be great if it was local. And the second point, I just, when I went through my son's IEP, I was like, okay. noticing that they weren't actually providing what he needed as far as saying, okay, he's saying he wants this career goal, but yet he's transitioning. They weren't transitioning him into those type of classes. And then just get him enrolled in that system program. So you just got to make sure that you push for what his interest in. If he qualifies, you know, because they're going to make sure academically he or she is able to do it. But it's a lot more programs that you can get him into. Okay. Yeah, and a good point, and I'm glad you said it, because when your child comes and there's a, you, they can have an agenda. Um, so I have a little girl who, um, at 14, we worked on it, and she took a written agenda, and she said she wanted to be a fashion designer, and the team was attentive, listened, and I'm on the other end of the phone, and they moved right off of it and said, and next year you'll take Spanish, and you have to get a computer credit, and we're like, um, you know, Mom, can you go back and finish talking about what your daughter just said because her mother needed to be a voice and they got her an art class. I mean, it's just amazing how hard it is to work on transition by yourself. So, you know, think it through, get your support people or get yourself really ready. Uh-oh, you. One thing that, and again, it's a very different population and we're very new to serving students on the ASD uh, spectrum, but um, my, uh, I'm Determined is a website, I'm Determined, and it has a lot of uh, resources for how students can become involved themselves, yes. and they have sample PowerPoints where the student can actually start their IEP meeting with this PowerPoint. Some of our students who have been DEA eligible, um, uh, all of them give their own PowerPoint. And it might start with, like you said, just their interest of in what they do around the house, um, what they like to eat, all of those. Or it might go into what their SAT scores are. It, it depends on the student. But it gives them a voice and then gives the parents a great platform saying, did you notice that he said this? Um, so it sounds more like the parent, or like the student is asking for it as opposed to OK, them. two things. It's collaborative. and. I stand corrected. I'm going to put back in my PowerPoint. I promise. But that self-determination, I'm going to put those links back in there because, yes, um, it's great to have, you know, I take too much time. I realize it's already 2.30 and we're not done yet. But if you all can hang in here, there are, there are many layers to this. And um, as much as you can help your child to be the independent, self-determining, person, you, you are really in the right direction. Because we've spent our whole life going to school meetings, being their spokesperson. We can't go and interview for their job either. They're going to get interviewed. So it really is thinking about now for the future, now for the future. I'm going to add that in there for both of you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so there are more, you know, apprenticeships are important too. Other technical, um, I've got a lot of guys like in the ITT, tech programs. It's easier to get in. Um, consider employment important. Practice interviewing. I'm Sam, I have autism. Isn't going to cut it. You know, really practicing. So when I get feedback from adults who have gone off to college or gone into the world of work, I get criticized for not role playing enough with them. And it's really much more effective if they can see themselves. You can use your phone and video model. Because if you see yourself, it sticks differently than having a, you know, a social cue you're missing because you're looking at a detail of something else in the picture. So this is effective. Role playing, role playing, role playing. Um, OK. Um, I'm not going to go over too many details, but again, just 
keep the resume going and volunteer and endpoints. I do have some sad stories of people who were not prepared for certain things at, on the job. One girl dropped out of college. She was so devastated because when she got hired by the place that she was volunteering, um, there was a step added that she needed to perform that she didn't see coming and it devastated her. She had to euthanize some animals and she was a great volunteer and so good with the pets and they said, well, what, what did you think was going to happen? She didn't see it coming. No one had given her the end point. So explaining all the way through, and you're so much better when you're prepared. Your anxiety levels go down. When you practice, you're prepared. You have choice. Surprises are devastating. Okay, so I just threw this in about housing. Just to let you know, DDA says you have to be 70 years old before you can apply to them for housing. Okay. So that's not the route to get housing. If you want supported housing, there are some other things. Like I told you there's a group in Howard County working on housing ideas. There was a big article this week about farming for folks who, have, who are adults with autism and how successful, you know, sort of a kibbutz kind of community living has been. But there's, there are lots of different levels of um, support in your home or out of your home. Um, it's just something to keep in mind that you want your, your adult has a right to independence. As there, in is, there is on the Eastern Shore examples of what you're saying and the ASD or learning developmental challenged people who are adults, live there, work there, get paid there. And that's something that if people could go and see just for a visit, take your student, because your child's going to be a student for the rest of his life. I mean, we all learn and grow. So, you know, your student and their student at the same time. And go visit what's on the Eastern Shore and learn how these people work hard every day to be happy. Do you know the name of the program you went to see? Not on top of my head. Was it Benedictine? No. Okay. I don't know. I, I know yeah. of my girlfriend has a next door neighbor mm -hmm. and her daughter lives there. So you don't have to be 70 as a provider, as a parent, but typically you have to do something to facilitate getting um, a, some other living arrangement. And joining up to, to learn what these options are is really important. Transportation jobs aren't all on transportation lines, but um, you know I believe you have to kind of learn to ride a bike and know what the rules of the road are before you can see traffic coming at you and driving a car. So riding a bike. Um, using public transportation and um, there are all these other modified programs paratransit mobility services you can get mobility after age six um, for your child howard county again this call a ride program is very nice um, this is a great link on the pathfinders for autism website time to think about driving anybody getting ready for that okay so I need to be able to talk about my condition. I need to know what to do with my health care card and be able to advocate for, for letting people know about my medical, my dental, and my um, mental health needs. And you want to find providers. There are going to be a million people with autism entering into the community, and there are not trained providers. So after, a f you know, you hit 18, start thinking about, is this provider going to age out? Kennedy has to age out. We can't keep our kids past, well, sort of loose, between 18 and 21-ish. But eventually, everybody's going to need to move to an adult provider. Start to think about who that's going to be. Um, oh, and develop an emergency procedure. We don't practice fire, getting lost all the scary stuff, but we need to practice those things because, um, you know, I've got kids who make wrong decisions, and that's all I want to say about that. It's, you know, there's, you can go a lot of directions. Be thinking that your child will be a sexual human being. So have, you know, this um, plan for understanding their no zones and um, high fives, knuckles. We aren't going to be hugging, kissing everybody because it's very hard to break that habit because everybody wants to be social in this world. But where do you start to draw the line as to who you're social with in, a, in an intimate way? You know, and friendship onto intimacy. 
Um, this is a really good book talking about puberty, masturbation, you know, being able to have a masturbation plan that's not the school bus and sitting in the living room and all those kinds of things are really important to start to think about. There's, there is much more on sexual development. Um, Circles is helping to work on um, friendships. So you know you have that circle around you of the family and then all the other assistants and allies in your, in your life. Our guys miss out on having peers give them a lot of information and a lot of social practice. So you guys are having to team up with the schools for the most part and maybe a little bit of community assistance, but you know it's, it's a lot of pressure on you to try to figure out how to handle these intimate relationships. So social stories, um, YouTube, those kinds of things can be very helpful. Our kids are at higher risk of being um, uh, you know, um, sexually abused or just sexually confused. I see many kids who are sexually confused. They may, their bodies are going to be right on target, but they, make, they link up to something that does, it seems to be a disorder, but really it's just some confusion. So as much as you can have clarity, the better. Okay, need to be out in the community. Um, I find that religious community activities and um, you know philanthropic, you know, a, a select group that you're far, part of. I mean, I have guys who are out there looking at the stars every Saturday night by the Science Center. They are the astronomy club, and they all find each other. Um, there are lots of other philanthropic clubs. You know the. Abilities Network or Bark or whatever groups that you can match up with, but practice. Um, you know these hobbies. Just, um, being able to choose what movie you want to go to, what place you want to eat out. All this, all that is really important development. Okay, so your child's going to be 18. They're going to be a legal adult. They can make their decisions. They have to write a note to give you permission to talk to me. So how do you deal with that if your child can't make those decisions independently? Um, so there is an incapacity for medical decision making where a doctor and another doctor or a doctor and a psychologist say that your child does not have capacity to make um, informed decisions medically. That's an, sort of an easy process to get those kinds of things signed off. But how do you cover yourself? Okay, so guardianship, that whole thing of um, the legal end of it. We all are able to make all of our informed decisions ourselves unless so I lose the right. I can give you permission to make a legal education, medical, financial, or person um, decision for me with a limited power of attorney, meaning I sign a note saying today you can go talk to Kathy Groshen. Or I could make it limited for a year, just for um, the schools. You can go to my school for this year to talk about my education. Or I can make it durable, so it's ongoing. So the Attorney General's website has um, durable power of attorney um, packets, and they've got you know, health advance directives and all this. So most people get a power of attorney um, However, if your child can't make that decision um, to give you that right, some parents need to go for guardianship. The difference between a power of attorney and a guardianship, if your child signs up for magazines for $90 a month, it's a good contract unless you're the guardian. Because as the guardian, you have to sign all contracts for them. Um, with power of attorney, though, it's short of the contracts. You can make all decisions as long as you have durable power of attorney in all those areas. So there are, I'm not a lawyer, and I just think that it's important to consider. There's a really good download, um, Guardianship and Its Alternatives, on um, Handbook of Maryland Law, written by Ellen Caligari. So it's a legal team that knows what they're doing to help you to get guardianship. You can do it yourself. You can pay the fees, but it, you know, it's pretty sophisticated. Um, your child has to be represented and you have to be represented. So it is an expensive process if you go through the lawyers to get guardianship because um, they have a right to be represented. It's, it's their civil rights. So that's why there's two sets of lawyers. And then the master makes the decision if you can have, if you can take all the rights of this person. So it's, it's, a, it's a really important step. So most people get a power of attorney 
and be covered that way. Okay, um, advanced directives, those are the medical care decisions. Um, you can write a letter of intent now before you get your will. Something happened to me today, who, what, where, you know, just so somebody has some guidelines. I hate to bring it up, but I can tell you that I, um, you know, every year have somebody who has this kind of emergency and um, I just talked to an uncle and he said, you know, I'm so glad I knew that his mother didn't want, want him to ever see violence because I love wrestling, but I'm not going to take him to the WWW. So, you know, just really personal things. It's just so important if you think that you want your child care taken by somebody that that's documented somewhere. These letter of intent are, you know, not a will, but they're, they're really taken very seriously. Adult males at 18 have to register for selective ser service. You know, that's, um, we're not in a draft situation. They're not going to be drafted, but they still have to register. And they can register to vote and can vote. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay, so back to self-advocacy. Okay, a curriculum you talked about, the um, undetermined curriculum. Um, okay, so you know there's a range with ASD diagnoses from more severe needs to people who have less severe needs, so socially or communication-wise. Um, and so it really is respectful to understand strengths and weaknesses and preferences. Um, there is a bias in that if you have a BIP, the Behavioral Intervention Plan, and you enroll in college, I mean, you can have an IEP um, go with you to college. I think that there's some discrimination against having a BIP when you apply. I wouldn't recommend putting the BIP on the IEP when you apply to college. Okay, um, working on your social skills. Any way to be able to do that in a constructive way where somebody isn't um, going to set your child up for failure, but can guide them. Um, so I told you about the, um, like Saturday morning now in, in Howard County, they have a teen um, group, social skills group. Um, Carroll County, there's a social um, teen group. Um, it's about 20 some guys now, and they do community service work together. There's the Husband Center. So there's places that are specific to ASD, but they're not in every neighborhood. Again, you know, it's still a little more fragmented. But um, these are evolving. There's one in Cadenceville, but it's only for boys. Which, it's through Lighthouse? Yeah. Yeah. So there are social skills training and groups, and you can purchase those services. Those are Lighthouse. We have them here at Kennedy Krieger. Um, but these are free, the ones I was talking about, um, just, um, you know, social get-togethers that are facilitated. And you're saying, uh, I've never heard anybody say the one at the hospital is free. Oh, uh, they did start charging. I think it's like 3 to $5 for that Friday yeah, night group. Say, yeah, um, they have a girls group that, you said you have a daughter, right? Yeah. They have a girls group, I think, that meets at Bill Bateman's on a regular basis. I think you have to chip in for the meal that you're eating together. They're not out to make. It makes money in food. Yeah. <laughs> but you have to dig for some of this information. So where do you get all that? Um, uh, these are all different places you can find information, newsletters, stay on the ASA websites, look at Autism Speaks, see what comes home from school. Um, the, um, there is an adult autism resource group. They meet across from was previously moms from the Baltimore Chesapeake chapter. And they meet at um, Ellen Pfeiffer's house, which is right in the heart of Towson. They started Itinerous. So they've, they've got a work group, they've got a parent support group. They'll, they have lawyers come to talk about guardianship issues. Sometimes I just go for the speakers, but they're, they're very inclusive. So after your child's 17, it's appropriate to start going to something like this. Um, this group is really getting going. And um, this is a couple years old, uh, so they have some Saturday lectures, but they're building more programs because they have a huge student body of one-on-one -on -one mentors. They, the students get credit, and the clients have a variety from art to pragmatic language to 
some physical exercise. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on. Yeah. Just to back up for one second. Uh, tomorrow doesn't tell me what time. It says that it 